Jake, it's great to see you today. Thanks for having me, Jason. Glad to be here. Jake, you're an American veteran, and you're also a well-known commentator about what is going on now in Ukraine. So I wanted to ask you a couple of questions. Recently, the Russians attempted a new offensive in Kharkiv. What do you see there? How'd that play out? Well, we've been bracing for this. We've known since the Russians took Avdivka uh, early, early this year uh, that they were playing another major offensive somewhere. We were expecting it maybe in Luhansk or Donetsk, because that's their stated objective, getting the entirety of these four oblasts. But Russia wanted to do a change up, and they decided to reinvade the Kharkiv oblast. And I'm convinced that the Russians thought this was a brilliant idea because of the restriction in policy, because the White House for the last two and a half years has been saying Western weapons or American donated weapons can't be used on the territory of Russia. Well, the Kremlin saw this as a cheat code and they thought, this is great. We'll use their own uh, red lines against them. We can build up and have our fuel warehouses, ammunition depots, command posts, troop concentrations on our side of the border. And then we'll surprise them. We'll knock them off guard. And there, there are there are speculation that Russia kicked off this summer offensive before they were ready. But because Congress passed uh, the aid bill in late April, they were trying to get ahead of these supplies reaching the front lines. So there is an argument that they went in before they were ready, but it's been an absolute disaster. I think it's been over two months now since Russia reinvaded the Kharkiv Oblast. If we want to go strictly off map updates, Russia controlled a lot more territory two and a half years ago. They lost Kharkiv in September of 2022. They then lost Kherson. Uh, they were kicked out of the north in the first two months of the war. The Black Sea fleet has retreated from the Black Sea. But Russia was convinced this was a brilliant idea, and they committed a lot of resources and a lot of manpower, and they've just gotten stuffed. They got five kilometers deep. Their goal had to have been at least 30 kilometers, and they've fallen flat on their face, taking huge casualties. So the decision to remain there, the decision to keep committing more metal and men to this failed offensive, it's political. They just don't want to admit this was a huge mistake. And with the reversal of policy from the White House and Western weapons can now be used on the territory of Russia, we've, we've prevented a reinvasion of Chernihiv and of Sumy. Uh, I, I don't see this happening. Russia doesn't believe it's to their advantage anymore. Hmm. So looking ahead, though, do you anticipate that Ukraine will have a breakthrough and a military victory is on the horizon that will liberate all the territories? How do you think that Russia will finally be ejected from Ukraine? Every day, Ukraine gains more capabilities as uh, funds that were allocated. This is just how the Western defense industry operates. You allocate money. We get this announcement of an aid package. It's fantastic news. But then you, you get the behind the scenes reports that this equipment won't show up for a year or something ridiculous. But we're two and a half years now into this war. So every day, stuff that was allocated maybe a year ago by Finland or by France or whoever, every day more metal and equipment and capabilities are getting into Ukrainian hands with the passage of this $60 billion in aid from the United States, with this breakthrough in the blockage from the G7, uh, taking frozen Russian assets and at least using the interest to help Ukraine's war effort. Ukraine's doing a fantastic job on the battlefields, but even if they're eliminating 1,000 Russian soldiers a day, 30, 40 armored uh, infantry fighting vehicles or tanks a day, shooting down a Russian plane every other day, it's, it's, it's not enough if Russia can still regenerate all of their lost combat capability inside of Russia. So on my channel, since the very early days, you can go back and look at my videos, I was saying for Ukraine to go on the offensive and retake all lost territory, that would be a tremendous cost for Ukraine. The faster and easier way is for there to be some kind of political or economic collapse inside of Russia. I think that's the most likely uh, ending scenario for this war. Russia loses the ability to regenerate their combat capability. There's a crisis at home. 
all the guys don't want to be in the occupied territories anymore, and they just go back to their own country. But Jake, when you look at the Russian economy, what sticks out to you? It seems to me that there's a lot going on. The interest rates just keep going up. It's becoming harder and harder for the average Russian. So Western components continue to be found in newly manufactured missiles and weapons. People are saying sanctions don't work. Sanctions have no effect, but that's not true. Sanctions do work in that they make the cost of business more expensive for the Russians. So rather than just being able to buy chips directly from companies like AMD or Texas Instruments, they now have to go through a, a medium, an, interme an intermediary uh, in Central Asia or Southeast Asia or whatever. But there's a 200 or 300 or 400 percent markup. So the real war map is how much money does Russia have left? When Putin came back into power in 2012, he, he reassumed the presidency. He had already made up his mind that he wanted the old Soviet territories back and he wanted to rebirth the Russian empire. So Putin committed to austerity for the Russian people going back to 2012 saving up this war chest of $600 billion. That's $600 billion that could have been spent on new infrastructure and hospitals and schools and growing the Russian economy. And he said, no, I need, I, need a, I need a war chest so that when I invade Ukraine or invade the Baltics or invade the Caucasus or invade Central Asia, we can survive the sanctions. Putin knew sanctions were coming. Sanctions were placed on Russia in 2014, but they were relatively minor. Europe continued buying gas like nothing happened. And, and this war will end when Russia runs out of money and they just have to print to pay their soldiers. And when you're just printing to pay your soldiers, welcome to hyperinflation. Russia's central bank can go ahead and raise their, their central rates to 20% or whatever. It doesn't matter. Who's, who's borrowing money in Russia at 20% APR to start a small business or to purchase a home. Like Russians are deferring these everyday transactions that you and I take for granted in the West, complaining about the Fed rate being at five or 6% or whatever. So this war will end when there's an economic crisis at home and ordinary Russians with their take home, take home pay can't even purchase a week's worth of groceries for their families. So do you see any indicators at this point that the Russian economy is getting closer to the point that it would be so much stress, so much pressure, that Putin is not able to continue the war any longer? At the moment, it's a sugar rush. And Russians inside of Russia are feeling the benefits. There's so much pressure being put on Russian men to sign these contracts from village elders, parents, spouses, because it's $2,000 a month to, to go fight for you know the glory of the empire, fight for Putin. But that, but that guy sitting in a trench in Donetsk is not getting $2,000 a month to enjoy his life. It's going towards his spouse. It's going towards his children, his parents, whoever. I mean, Putin's smart to impoverish a significant percentage of his population and then dangle these contracts, $2,000 a month, in front of them. Because that's a big stimulus to that household, to that family, to that local community. And that's what we're feeling right now. The Russian economy is growing. GDP is increasing in Russia. But what happens when the runny runs out, runs out and, and Putin has to print? Additionally, what they're spending money on isn't, isn't, an, isn't an investment in Russia's future. Spending all your mon money on tanks and bombs that are just expended and lost in Ukraine, that's not going to help your economy when you're not spending money on hospitals, schools, tunnels, bridges, modern airports, uh, Putin is very careful to keep everything polished and shiny in Moscow and St. Petersburg. Those are the propaganda capitals. Those are where the, the inner elites reside. Those people need to be prote protected for Putin to remain in power. But for everywhere else in Russia, the money has to become worthless, where $2,000 a month the equivalent in Russian rubles doesn't mean anything. It doesn't buy you what you need to survive anymore. So if Ukraine or the West wish to put more pressure on Russia, namely economic pressure, 
what do you think they should be doing right now? Well, I think Ukraine has found uh, the silver bullet. I think going after all these refineries has Putin the most freaked out. All of this commotion, it's it's gotten actually really weird the last two weeks with the Russians constantly signaling they're open to talks, they're open to a ceasefire if they just get everything they want. But why now? Why is Putin himself in a press conference talking about ceasefires when he wasn't doing it a year ago, when he wasn't even doing it six months ago? And President Zelensky just last week said 30 or 40 or something ridiculous, Russian oil depots and refineries have been struck in the last six months. We're about to go into a Russian winter, and winter in Russia is quite brutal. But we're about to go into a winter in Russia where probably greater than 50% of their refinery capacity will be offline. Can Russian society make it through winter comfortably or acceptable, some kind of acceptable level of uh, suffering <laughs> with, without kerosene, without diesel, without gasoline? They've gone from a net exporter as of December of last year to now a net importer relying on their neighbors. And every day it's just going to get worse. Ukraine has to keep going after these refineries. And it's shocking because initially people's reaction was this will cause the price of gasoline here in the United States to go up before the November election. When in reality, it's actually lowered the price of oil for other refiners. If Russia can't refine it itself, it's forced to export. That's the global supply. Doesn't matter if they're putting their oil on tankers and it's going to India. India has excess refining capacity. The United States probably has excess refining capacity at the moment. So we just need things to slush around and for Russia to not profit. The world still needs Russia's oil. That's, that's the hard truth to accept. But we can knock the refineries offline and then increase capacity at other points in the world in order to smooth out this supply. So you've seen in the new sanctions that have come out the different sorts of pressure that the United States is trying to put, including sanctioning secondary banks and banks and even in China that Russia has historically used to get around sanctions. What do you think about that? And what other sort of sanctions do you think the West should be seeking to introduce to put the most pain on Russia? This is fascinating because uh, the article I read explaining this it's really hard for uh, the United States government to enforce sanctions because the way that corporations structure themselves, the exact same person in the exact same location doing the exact same function can just create a new shell company, rename himself, and he's a brand new company that you have to then add to the sanctions list. But there's a, but the United States is basically deputizing banks in China to be the enforcers, saying... We know what you're doing. We know it's the exact same people in the exact same place doing the exact same thing, buying chips from whoever and then selling it to the Russians to help their war machine. So if we catch you doing business with the exact same people in the exact same way in violation of sanctions, but under a new name, just because they created a new shell company in the Cayman Islands or whatever, well, now we're going to sanction your bank and you won't be able to uh, do transactions in dollars or get clearance for large transactions through the Treasury Department or whatever. And I do think there are Chinese banks concerned about this because it's not easy for them just to rename themselves to avoid secondary sanctions. So this is having a huge impact. This is, this is actually working to get Chinese banks to comply with sanctions that have already been placed on individuals or companies helping Russia's war efforts. Uh, so yeah, more of this. I, I mean... It's hard. I know I know it's hard for Western governments to threaten banks because uh, that could potentially hurt your economy. For example, we'll just walk through the example of the 300 billion in frozen assets uh, belonging to Russia in Western banks. If that money was seized, taken out and then given to Ukraine, well, this would panic authoritarian regimes or dictators around the world that love keeping their money in Western banks. And I know a lot of people are saying, why do we do that? Why do we even do business with the Saudi regime or dictators in Africa or whoever? 
and I don't have a good ethical answer for that, but we do. And if we stop doing business with them, uh, then it's our economies that'll shrink. It'll be a run on our banks with our own citizens with deposits freaking out, causing Credit Suisse or whoever to go bankrupt again. We don't want that. Uh, so this compromise of the interest with the G7, I, I do think ultimately in the end, Ukraine will get access to that 300 billion in frozen Russian assets, but there's gonna be a court process. Uh, Russia will have representation, Russia will participate. And, and whatever government replaces Putin's regime, they're going to accept the ruling. They're gonna say, yeah, we're at fault for this war. The money that was frozen in Western banks that's going to go towards Ukraine's reconstruction. Russia's going to agree to that in exchange for sanctions being lifted and diplomatic relations being normalized. Let me ask you just one last question. How do you foresee the Putin regime falling? What would that look like? What do you think, how that would play that out? Well, every day we wake up, there is a chance somebody put a bullet in Putin's head. Uh, that's unfortunately how a lot of dictators uh, lose their lives. Uh, somebody conducts a palace coup and you got to get rid of the guy at the top before you think you can make your own move. Uh, so the, the probability of a bloodless transition in Russia, in my opinion, is zero. Prigozhin, I think, just pulled the trigger too soon. If Prigozhin had just waited another year, I think he would have had more sympathizers. He would have had more collaborators and he might have been successful. And everyone else is pretty darn careful to keep a low profile because if you're the nail that sticks out, you're going to get hammered. Putin is looking for these people that might threaten or challenge him. A good uh, explanation why Putin appointed this economist as defense minister is he doesn't have any military experience. If you're paranoid about being overthrown by your military leadership, then it's actually pretty smart of Putin to put a con an economist with no military experience in the job of defense minister. So that's the fastest scenario. The slower one is things get painful, civil unrest, rioting, protests. These terrorist attacks in the Caucasus, this is a symptom of the Russian state weakening. Their security apparatus to keep this multi-ethnic empire together involves surveillance and brutal oppression. But every human has their breaking point. Every human, even a Russian, will say at some point, this is intolerable. Rolling the dice and seeing if we can get a different czar might be my best option. Jake, that's really fascinating. Thanks a lot for your time today. Thanks for having me, Jason.